Uh, thank you for joining us today for the second webinar of the series Decolonize the Lens. Uh, this is a four-part series of discursive events with photographic experts and scholars who will look at the local history of photography in Egypt and Northeast Africa to consider ways to decolonize the imperial gaze. In each of the four-part series, one of the program's guest speaker will present a different approach to rethinking the dominant narratives in the history of photography. Uh, Decolonize the Lens is a joint research project uh, between, uh, faculty in, uh, fa uh, between faculty in the uh, Department of Journalism and Mass Communications, the History Department, and the Photographic Gallery. Uh, if you missed the first webinar, uh, you can watch its recording, which is now available at uh, the gallery's YouTube channel, uh, and which I will post the link to uh, in the chat box. Um, and before we start today's presentation and discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce the photographic gallery and my collaborators who will alternate moderating the sessions throughout the series, uh, Ronnie Close and Mark Dietz. And I will also introduce today's guest speaker, uh, Lucy Rizova. Um, the Photographic Gallery was founded in 1991 as part of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications at the School of uh, Global Affairs and Public Policy. The gallery is located in the new Cairo campus of the university, and it offers a public program of exhibitions, educational projects, workshops, and talks around the academic year and showcases uh, photography works by young, emerging and established local and international photographers and students. Uh, Ronnie Close uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications at the American University in Cairo. Uh, his research interests look at the relationship between aesthetics and politics, and he has worked on a long-term project on the ultras football movement in Egypt, Brazil and Palestine. Uh, through visual research projects, workshops, and written publications, he looks at the role of the image object in the contemporary world. Uh, Mark Dietz is Assistant Professor of African and World History at the AUC. He is a social and cultural historian of modern Africa with a research focus on the Senegambian region of West Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, his research emerges from his diplomatic experience in Senegal, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritania, and Cape Verde. His current book project, uh, based on his 2017 dissertation at Cornell University, is a socio-cultural history of the Casamanca uh, conflict in southern Senegal, tentatively entitled A Country of Defiance, Mapping the Casamanca in Senegal. Uh, Mark's work has been published in History of Africa, the Journal of Asian and African Studies, the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of American History, and the blog site Africa is a Country. Uh, today's guest speaker, uh, Lucy Rizova, uh, teaches modern uh, Middle East history at the University of Birmingham, United Kingdom. She's a social and cultural historian of modern Egypt with particular interest in Egyptian popular culture, vernacular modernity, and the social history of photography. She's the author of The Age of the Afandeya, Passages to Modernity in National Colonial Egypt, Oxford University Press 2014, and a number of articles and book chapters. Her second major book titled Camera Time, Photography and the Making of Modern Egypt will be released soon. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank uh, the American University in Cairo for funding this program. And I will give you an idea about the format we will be using today. Uh, since we're using the webinar format, you will only be seeing the co-hosts on your screen, and we will not be using the raise hand feature. But you can still make comments and ask questions via the chat box throughout Lucy's talk, which is approximately uh, 20 minutes long. Uh, then Mark and I will collect your questions for Ronnie to post to Lucy after the talk, and then Lucy can address the most popular questions since time is limited. Um, so let's get started. Um, Rani, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dina. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along. We're really uh, excited and delighted to have Lucy Rizova with us today. And we're really looking forward to a presentation, which where we will be returning to the ocular from our sort of deviation in the last webinar into the soundscapes of Cairo. 
um, with Zaid Fahmi. We'll be dealing, looking at, you know, these kind of photographic vernacular material from 19th and early 20th centuries. So um, as uh, Dina said, the format will be that we, we will invite you to, uh, after Lucy's presentation, which will be around 20 minutes, we'll invite you to uh, use the chat feature to pose questions. And when you do that, please give us your name as well. That would be really uh, handy for the coherence. And we will pose the questions to Lucy then. Um, so we'll have about hopefully around 30 minutes, half an hour for a, a third discussion of her research and of the uh, topic area. And also, uh, we'll also be putting our emails into the chat. So if you have any further comments afterwards or questions, please do email us and let us know uh, about the webinar series and today's event. So without further ado, I won't delay. Uh, Lucy, it's over to you. It's Vidali. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfect. Yeah. You can hear me. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a huge honor to be here. It's a pleasure, it's a joy to share this project with you. So just you know, minutes before we all met here, um, I had this uh, computer disaster in which the other screen on which my, um, my talk is all uh, sort of prepared and nicely written out, uh, decided to run updates. And there is probably an, uh, about a minute or two minutes remaining. And the question is, one, one, once this other screen opens, whether I will be able to actually find my paper, okay? So this is my paper currently. So I have to improvise for a couple of minutes. So let me just start by sharing my screen with you. At least I have some images. So if I completely fail, okay. okay. If I completely fail, to open my paper, which seems like, oh, okay, there we go. There is hope, there is hope. I may still be able to present. Anyway, let me just, nope, nope. There we go, I managed to open my paper. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank me so much in, for inviting me. Let's just hope it doesn't disappear again. I will be presenting to you my current project called Camera Time, Photography and the Making of Modern Egypt. So this project started about 15 years ago. Okay, almost there, almost there, almost there. As a social history of photography in Egypt, specifically focusing on vernacular or popular photographic practices. Would these be ordinary visits to commercial studios to have one's portrait taken, often in a very formulaic fashion, or the countless and often even more formulaic instances of snapping oneself, one's friends and one's family with a home-owned uh, camera? Now, the temporal focus of my project is between the late 19th and throughout the first half of the 20th century. You can call this period colonial, as it certainly was, but it was also the era of high modernity in Egypt, as it was anywhere in the world. So modernity is really my key historical framing and the one that most reflects my sources. The book is really about the centrality of vernacular photographic practices to forms of modern life, not only in Egypt, but anywhere in the world. And about what can attention to ordinary photographic practices tell us about modern Egyptian history, but also what does it tell us about modernity as a historical and cultural condition. So initially my aim was to use ordinary everyday photographs as my key primary sources and to write a history of local Egyptian modernity through photographic practices. And the stress is again on practices and you will see why. But as the project matured, I told you it's about 15 years old, it also get, got a bit out of hand and became a sort of historiographical experiment. 
I'm using photographs, I'm still using photographs as my key primary, primary sources with text as mere kind of appendages helping me to unpack the photographs that's trying to reverse or subvert the common practice among historians in which we always rely, rely firstly, first and foremost on texts and then we use images um, as kind of a bolt on or as, as illustrations, so I'm doing that. But, and I'm still writing a cultural history of Egyptian modernity, but I'm also using photographs as think spaces, as historiographical drivers that allow me to ask different historical questions than those normally afforded by texts or to ask existing historical questions slightly differently. Uh, I didn't come up with this. I'm of course standing on the shoulders of giants. I am uh, deeply inspired by the work of Elizabeth Edwards and Chris Binney and others. So the ambition here is as much about valorizing the visual in mainstream historical practice as it is about valorizing local vernacular forms of modernity, or these are my two ambitions. So the book has two, uh, sorry, the book has four really long chapters. Uh, each chapter departs from or is inspired by some very common genre of vernacular photography and goes on to address some much larger questions or themes. I mean, it kind of exceeds the frame of the photograph um, often by actually a large stretch uh, uh, trying to intervene into various historiographical debates. And so these four core themes are visuality or the senses, um, space, time and personhood. So I will be quickly running through these four chapters with you, and then I can unpack various details later. So my first chapter is called Disenchanted Eye. It focuses on vision, visuality, and gender. In the Egyptian context, these are, of course, deeply linked because gender is largely constructed through notions of female visibility, and it was even more so throughout history. So this chapter takes as its starting point the genre of wedding photographs that emerged and became popular among middling Muslim urban Egyptians in the 1920s. This was a new representational practice that contrasted sharply with how weddings unfolded only two decades earlier. According to the rules of female seclusion that governed middle and upper class sociability until at least the turn of the 20th century, it was inconceivable for the groom to see his bride before the night of the consummation. And it was of course inconceivable for strangers, for strangers to see the bride or to see the wife ever. Now evidence presented by photographs, by their material qualities and sometimes by the captions on them makes it very clear that this changed rather radically in the 1920s. Brides from respectable families started to be photographed wearing dresses showing no small amount of flesh and their enlarged photographs were hung in living rooms like the picture you're seeing here printed in small postcard format. These were often sent to distant relatives relatives and uh, acquaintances and thus circulated within broader social circles than would have been previously allowed you know you see sorry i need to interrupt you i think nobody can see the powerpoint i think you uh oh my god How yeah <laughs> i think you were so wrapped up in getting your paper up um you, oh, you might have forgot to share the screen yeah can you see it now uh no we no we can just see you okay I deeply apologize. It's okay. Um, yes. That is okay. very awkward indeed. Yeah, we can see it now. That's great. We I can see been, your screen. Oops, I have been showing images all along, so I deeply apologize for this. Yeah, maybe you want to go back and just go through it. So people well, it was can... really, yeah. So this was the main image about when I was talking about the changing sort of visual conventions uh, of marriage. This is the key photograph on which I was focusing. And uh, the photograph, the, the sort of the images that I showed earlier, I will actually return to them later. So I apologize for this. So as I said, sort of large for a large format uh, photographs hanging in homes and, and then, you know, smaller formats circulating among a much larger pool of sort of social acquaintances. Now, the emergence, and should I also make it bigger? Yeah, that'd be great. I think because, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, okay, that's, more, that's more immersive. <laughs> Indeed, that was the intention. <laughs> The emergence of such novel visual practices thus opens a range of questions. 
I partly, so it partly contributes to the thriving, so this chapter sets to answer these questions, partly contributing to the thriving field of gender history in Egypt, which however remains predominantly textual, focusing on women's writing and their voices. So here I stress that regardless of learned intellectual debates in print, the message that most ordinary and not very highly educated women received was much simpler. It was actually about if you want to be modern, you have to become visible. This is what underpins the well-known discursive processes of creating the modern woman in modern Egypt, well described by my colleagues, whereby women unveil but female respectability and modesty becomes enacted through other means such as education, demeanor and character. But it also this sort of this, this sort of initial thinking about this sort of sudden boom of visualization of the brides also leads me towards a much less well charted territory of the history of the senses. Um, and specifically of vision at the onset of colonial modernity. So I argue that these novel practices of gendered visualization points to a deeper shift in sensory priorities in the understanding of vision and the role of visuality in society. And that ultimately the remaking of gender or gender norms was connected to a parallel reconfiguration in the ontology of the senses. And so how I mean this or what I'm doing in this chapter is that I'm trying to reconstruct how was vision understood in the pre-colonial context and how visibility or the absence of its structured human conduct and interaction, not only in reference to Ill urban middle strata women, but also more broadly. And so I argue, I try to reconstruct something that I call the pre-colonial eye. And this pre-colonial eye was really, really works on two levels. It was really firstly, uh, the eye was understood as an organ that was haptic, more akin to a touch. And secondly, not the sole locus of optical vision. So maybe to put this um, sort of in, in, in different terms or slightly, slightly differently, one way to understand it is to actually take the evil eye seriously as a historical phenomenon. The evil eye is a pre-colonial eye in a way, the opposite of the eye of modernity, because the evil eye, if you want, quote unquote, the pre-colonial eye is an active eye. It's an eye that touches and it has an, it's an eye that has tangible consequences. And you don't find this only in Egypt, you actually find it across uh, cultures around the world. And secondly, as you probably know, in Egypt, there are other ways of seeing, such as the basira, associated with other, eye, uh, with other uh, bodily organs, such as the heart. And so from this older perspective, optical vision was actually understood as deceptive and as hiding or obscuring the real, which was associated with realms outside of human perception. And so this is a very different ontology of the senses to which the concept of satyr, of covering or non-exposure is central. Again, satyr is a deeply local Egyptian um, uh, term uh, that basically speaks about the existence of invisible forces that are nevertheless very real and that dictates that everything precious, beautiful or source of prosperity needs to be shielded needs to be covered, not only from undeserving humans, such as strange men, but also from other invisible creatures. So this is, of course, the logic that informs uh, or informed historically uh, female seclusion, but it's also much broader. You know, it's also about a different ontology of the senses. And so this is what the chapter does. And then it focuses on the role, really, of uh, technologies of visual representation and mediation uh, the role that these technologies played in forging a new kind of eye, the kind of modern eye, the eye of modernity, the eye that is passive and that merely observes and receives stimuli instead of, you know, sending and, and, and um, emitting. So um, I am specifically concerned with the camera set within a broader context of the new print economy. My key argument is that everyday practices of visual reproduction, particularly print and photography, were crucial to the normalization of this new kind of vision, the sort of flat and passive modern eye. And these technologies in a way work to disenchant the eye, so to speak, and primarily by forging what was, what was hitherto a new concept, the concept of a mere copy of mere representation in which the, the, the sign is ontologically uh, fully separated from the reference. 
And at the end of this chapter, I again return to the issue of radically changing wedding conventions in the early years of the 20th century in order to show how such processes enabled or conditioned a new culture of display to which female bodies became central. So that was a bit too much about my first chapter, but you get the idea. My second big chapter is called Strolling and the City. It focuses on the nexus of photographs and space, or rather the urban space. Like the rest of the chapters, again, this one departs from one specific genre of photographs, specifically um, urban street photography, which became very popular in the 1930s and especially 40s. It took a uh, place almost exclusively in the modern parts of the city, what we now call downtown, but, but back then was known as New Cairo. These types of photographs were produced either by ambulant commercial photographers, as I can show you here, who working for one of the many dozens of studios concentrated in this area, uh, uh, roamed the streets, and snapped passersby, and then the next day you could buy your photograph from the studio. Or it was produced uh, by um, home-owned Kodak that especially young men brought with them strolling through the city boulevards, and these were my two earlier photographs. So this chapter intervenes into the urban history of Cairo by putting emphasis on modes of urban experience and the historically specific ways of understanding and relating to space or practicing the city. These photographs bear witness to a specific connection between photographic practices, this particular part of town, the modern part uh, of the colonial metropolis, and the new spatial and new spatial practices such as strolling and promenading for leisure. As you see on these photographs, coming to stroll here, passersby are acutely aware of themselves. They are putting themselves on stage. Most have come here to see and to be seen often purposefully seeking the camera, as the caption down, down there says, Sawarnayam. Such spatial practices were new and had emerged only over the previous uh, several decades, but we can say over the previous half a century. And so the key aim of this chapter is to trace how did such novel understanding of bodies and space come about and the emergence of new culture of visibility and display that marked certain urban spaces as modern and that marked certain people as modern? The obvious answer here is the emergence of urban capitalism and the new culture of shopping and, and commercialized leisure, which entailed and necessitated not only new forms of mobility, but also a new relationship between bodies and space or new ways of being in space. And central to this, to these changes was a fundamental reshaping in the notions of anonymity and the new culture of publicness. This was again largely predicated on the disappearance or neutralization of the pre-colonial uh, active haptic eye, as I have described it earlier, and the emergence of anonymity and display as positive or even desirable qualities. So I focus on uh, the new spatial on how this new spatial order of visibility and display was predicated on a laborious process of sanitizing or making invisible an older epistemology of space through manifold ways of policing unruly bodies and sounds. And here my work, of course, builds very much on what Ziad Fahmi was talking about uh, in your last uh, seminar. I contrast the pre-colonial spatial practices. Uh, I contrast pre-colonial spatial practices, which I understand actually through an idiom and a sort of concept of the zaffa, with the emerging modern idiom of the traffic, understanding them as radically different ways of conceiving the relationship between bodies and space, and ultimately enabling different forms of both personhood and governmentality. So the older logic of space was both embodied and personal, personalized and substantially unphotographable actually, contrasting rather sharply with the anonymized space and mediated experiences evident in these photographs. I describe how photographic, how photographic practices participated in these processes. The modern subject wielding the camera emerges precisely through distancing himself from that older epistemology of space and its associated spatial practices. And of course, secondly, what is visible on these photographs is leisure, fun, and joy. 
these young people clearly have a good time and they spend large part of their leisure strolling the boulevards of New Cairo. Thus, I also inquire about how notions of fun, enchantment, and thrill changed at this period. I describe how older forms of fun exemplified most clearly in the mullet gave way to commercialized entertainment and how some very similar experiences became actually constructed as radically different. And I should probably briefly add that this chapter not only focuses on sort of the photography and urban space, but also specifically on young men, okay, and the relationship of young men to the city, city center. Now, my next chapter is called A History of One's Own. Again, it has a double focus. It's the connection between photographic portraiture and self-writing. It's one of the focus and the other focus is time and temporality. I look at, at formal portraits taken in the late and especially uh, early 20th century Egypt. And later in the chapter, I moved to homemade portraiture and practices of album making, which thrived among young middle-class Egyptians in the middle decades of the 20th century. But my key focus is uh, sort of the sort of parallel uh, practices of self-writing and self-photographing. Because not only was photography new to colonial Egypt, but also new forms of personal and often intimate writing emerged, or in some cases amplified and intensified, such as writing of letters, diaries, and intimate journals. So throughout this chapter, I demonstrate how personal photographic practices and self-writing were used in similar ways by middle-class Egyptians, especially young men. And this similarity is not really accidental because both personal photography and self-writing are ego documents. They are forms of inscription that allow a, for a particular presentation of self to others. The key argument here is that these are practices or technologies, if you want, of the self a la Foucault, that allow and encourage the production of some very modern forms of selfhood. It is a self that appears atomized or individualized, but of course this individuality is contingently or contextually produced precisely through these very uh, representational practices. Such modern self, fully in control of its own representation or seeming uses the pen and the camera to examine its own interiority, its own mental states and moods, its emotions such as love, which are very common themes uh, across these, these practices, um, and that are uh, enacted, exteriorized, and examined through these representational and narrative acts. Would, there be, would they be visual or would they be textual? So it is also a self that is split in two in the act of narration. It is both the observer and the observed uh, in its own form of being. Now, this self uh, represent, representing, if you want, modern personhood is always deeply implicated in modern forms of time and temporality. Or put differently, focusing on practices of self-writing and self-photographing always brings up time and temporality because these ego documents or practices of inscription are always also attempts at capturing or ordering time in one way or another. There are briefly uh, two different temporal rhythms. Uh, we have portraiture, which seemingly timeless, actually often works to mark the passage of time, birthdays, graduations, or weddings. Uh, or very often holidays, such as the age, for instance, or other crucial rites of passage that are always uh, about uh, temporal rhythms and temporal markers. And similarly, textual narrative acts, would they be long narrative captions or diary entries, work to order time and give it a sense of direction and linear sequence, as they also work to imbue time with productive value, of course. And so here, photographs and other personal practices of inscription work to establish and normalize time as linear and progressive. They crystallize vernacular notions of historical time or allow every person to have a history of their own, which is where the title of the, cap uh, of the chapter comes from. But there are also uh, very different kinds of time of uh, sort of temporalities, uh, both sort of enacted and captured in these photographs, you know. Um, Sometimes these photographs and these photographic practices arrest time and create liminal pockets of meandering or liminal sort of um, uh, poetic time. 
the time of leisure, of fun and joy, filled with fictional and often transgressive possibilities and performances of selfhood. So here I think that these practices of personal inscription work as metaphors of what really happens to time under capitalism. They show how the ordered disciplinary time of modernity is organically dependent on liminal pockets of temporal autonomy, the liminal time of fun and leisure, and how both make each other possible. Now, do I, I know that I have lost some time at the beginning. Can I go ahead for about five minutes about my last chapter? I see you nodding, okay. So my last chapter is called Studio Magic. And it looks at portraiture, both portraiture done in commercial studios uh, or in homes using portable consumer cameras. So in the years following World War I, affordable commercial studios proliferated in provincial cities across Egypt. And in the 1920s and 30s, handheld consumer cameras, or what we call the Kodaks, became relatively widely available to people and families on middling incomes. This chapter looks at this, at this moment of the democratization of portraiture, if you want, um, in, in interval region, which has, which has produced a vast archive scattered in countless family collections, which is often markedly repetitive and formlike. Broadly speaking, the chapter theorizes the relationship between camera and the person, between the camera and the person, by focusing on the spatial and temporal dimensions of the photographic event itself, the actual encounter between a person and the camera, using concepts of liminality and performance. Theoretically and historiographically speaking, this chapter combines performance theory with recent historical writing on modernity that rejects modernity as rational and disenchanted, and brings enchantment back into the picture. Magic as we understand it today was a distinctly modern, the magic as we understand it sort of in this revision, revisionist, if you want take on magic, is a distinctly modern experience um, that was pervaded by new or modern um, urban entertainments and technologies. And this is exactly how I understand um, the photographer's studio. I argue that the encounter between a person and the camera and the space of the studio uh, represented a form of modern magic where anyone could momentarily transform themselves into another social being. These moments of photographic exposure or photographic sittings are best understood as cultural performances of the self, which were both liminal and highly self-reflexive. They were again temporal pockets of heightened self-awareness of acting out of a variety of social roles. The camera created stages for often theatrical performances of a range of desired and fictional uh, forms of selfhood. Now, this, of course, worked differently for different social groups. Broadly speaking, affordable studios offered the opportunity for culturally fluid or traditional or lower middle class women to enact their aspirational selves as modern urban ladies. The role of the photographer is interesting here as the magician, I argue, who uses both technology and the range of props to transform these women into glamorous bourgeois, bourgeois females for the picture. But once the magic or the spell was learned, the photographer could be entirely dispensed of. Here I discuss photographic sessions in homes where upper middle class girls of leisure obsessively snapped themselves with their Kodaks, often donning a variety of fictional costumes for the camera. For these women who did not need to assert their bourgeois urbanity because they were born as such, photography offered an opportunity to experiment with a range of fictional and often transgressive selves, often inspired by cultural models propagated by mass mediated popular culture, such as the cinema, and illustrated magazines. So these reflexive moments of cultural performance spe speak of the specific kinds of, 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 of um, expectations and aspirations that Egyptians from different social backgrounds held for themselves at this crucial historical juncture. I'm going to skip probably because I am out of time. I also discuss how various notions that today we take for granted were actually crystallizing at this uh, period through photographic practices and through, as I said, the encounters uh, between the camera and people, notions such as the bourgeois body, 
bourgeois lookability, sort of body postures, notions of cleanness, I think, became redefined as visually, as, as something that's defined visually, actually, as well as notions of, um, of family, really, what is the family and so on. All these sort of uh, notions, if you want, crystallized through these encounters with the camera. And so um, just to Just to conclude, what I also wanted to add is that the chapter, of course, ends with a discussion of the ways in which these photographs circulated, or what I call secondary performances, all the manifold ways in which these photographs were used, circulated, exchanged among friends and sort of exhibited or, or uh, conversely hidden, hidden from others. So to conclude, everyday personal photographic practices I argue throughout this project, were the key rituals of modern life. They were essential to the ways through which people constituted themselves as modern subjects. And this worked in many different ways, enabling performances of modernity in the flow of the everyday. Photographs enabled some key aspects of modern personhood, the illusion of individuality or contingent individualism, the control over one's own representation, and the desire to become another social being through the photographic sessions that I just described, where the quasi-magical apparatus of photography afforded men and women the possibility to enact a range of aspirational, experimental, experimental or fictional selves. But also this worked through the very subtle, manifold sort of subtle ways in which photographs insinuated themselves into the flow of the everyday or into the everyday lives of historical subjects and how these photographic practices worked to normalize new notions of time, to reconfigure space, gender, and the very nature of visibility itself. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lucy. I think you need to stop sharing the screen. Um, so we kind of... Yes. Yes. So we go back to some... Um, view i'm not sure what the view actually is now for everyone i think we're still sharing right is that dina do you know stop share there you go yeah it was ah, okay excellent okay that looks more um feasible for everyone um so i just want to i mean we're getting questions actually as you were speaking if they're flooding in so but just to give us a chance to kind of uh go through them and get things ready to present to you i just have a question i'd want to ask and thank you for a, a really amazing talk I, I i loved it um so i just wanted to ask you about you know your focus on vernacular photography in 19th 20th century period and you know how this is um a really kind of unique visual heritage of egypt and how do you think that sits within the kind of dominant narrative of the history of photography. And I'm thinking in particular of what you mentioned when you were talking about chapter one, about this uh, pre-colonial eye you were kind of talking about. You were talking about this kind of superstitious mysticism um, that uh, of course still is, is quite, uh, still simultaneously coexists within cultural contexts even today. But, but you know, how that is meeting uh, this um, kind of, you know, this modern European, optical sort of surveillance panoptic um, technology that, that is coming in. And, and what's the kind of interaction there? Thank you. Well, well, there was more than one question in this, uh, Ronnie, I think so. <laughs> so yes, I don't know which part of your question you want, uh, you want me to address, but I will try to address the two, two components of your question. I mean, because you've asked me this question before, before we went live, you asked me about how did this project originate? And, uh, and, and what about, you know, I keep saying it's, it's been sort of really long in the making and it really originated. And I think this is also methodologically important. The, the project uh, uh, sort of originated through simply seeing photographs everywhere. Uh, throughout my first, you know, the, my, my PhD, which then became my first book throughout, you know, all this sort of period of apprentice apprenticeship, I was encountering photographs everywhere. Would it be, you know, in flea markets? Would it be in uh, families in private collections? Uh, would it be with, you know, um, older Egyptians with whom I was doing oral history interviews and sort of talking about completely different things and photographs would just start popping up everywhere. 
And so I became fascinated. So I became aware of this heritage, as you call it, or I call it the local archive. Um, and so uh, also, so I started sort of paying attention to them. And, and then also I was encountering colleagues or showing it to people and everybody was saying, yeah, I've seen this, there is tons of it. But how, what do you do with it? What can you do with this? You know, and of course, these kind of photographic vernacular traditions are deeply global. And this is something that, you know, this is, again, the sort of guiding premise of the book, which is that these are actually deeply uh, global practices. Um, not only they are deeply global, but they are also deeply mimetic. There is a very strong desire for sameness. People went to the photographer's studio to have a picture taken to look like someone else, to look like my neighbor or like that picture on the advertising or like Laila Murat that I've seen on the cinema. So I think we, we need to, or, or, or you know, the girls that I have seen, you know, the beautiful girls that I have seen in a shop window or on advertising or, or in magazines. So we need to account for this sort of desire for sameness, this mimetic sort of mimetic magic. So, so take it seriously. Uh, so that's an attempt to actually do something with photographs uh, and also, as I said, the historiographical challenge to actually allow for them to actually do other things than just purely visually. They're very circulation and they're very sort of social being uh, in the world. Um, as, per the second, as per the second part of your question, I do realize, of course, that when I say the evil eye, uh, people may start laughing or people may be unfamiliar with this. And I do agree that there may be an element of exaggeration, but also the more I start explaining this and more people start thinking about this, the more it makes sense. And of course that for the sake of making a point, of course that not all I was evil I, okay? I'm trying to sort of shift the nuance towards somewhere else and say that yes, of course, that the, uh, the eye as an organ was actually understood very differently. When you start paying attention to it, it's all over the sources. And actually the point is it has not disappeared. It still exists in Egypt, of course. Okay, but the sort of the suppression of the so-called evil eye, which I actually am only using as a shorthand for a different understanding of how the senses work and a different causality and a different ontology of the world. This is still there, just as in my chapter two, the modern spaces of the metropolis have not have not sanitized other forms of practices, but actually it's the constant constant production of difference between the kind of, you know, this between the sort of the modern spaces of the city and the modern people and what is sort of local and what is, uh, you know, sort of different. It's the constant production of difference, uh, if you want, throughout these manifold venues and manifold social practices that actually constitutes local Egyptian modernity. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience, actually. So there's one here I can see from Christopher Elias. Uh, he says, I'm incredibly struck by the photographs you shared near the end of your presentation of women playing, oh, hang on, it's just moved, playing dress up uh, in often transgressive ways. I think we all know the photos you're talking about. Actually, they're quite, quite well known. I think we've all come across them. Uh, who do you think was the audience for those images, especially the ones including cross-dressing and perhaps suggested lesbianism? Do you think they were meant to be shared with friends, only the participants, or more publicly? Yes. So, so yes, they are, they are well known. Actually, they are well known to people who, I guess, follow, follow Egyptian history, follow popular culture, because they have more recently been coming up. You know, scholars have focused on them. Uh, they, they exist across a variety of private collections. They exist also in the Arab Image Foundation. There is a, there is a scholar, Yasmin uh, Nan, I think, in, in Lebanon who has focused on the Lebanese case. And this was a very common practice, not only in Egypt, but also, as I just said, in Lebanon. Among, you know, it was a distinctly upper middle class practice among what I call girls of leisure, unmarried uh, young women of leisure, where the ownership of camera, they clearly had their, their little cameras at home, and where the ownership of the camera sort of literally engendered new social practices, okay, and the new, these new social practices were actually costume sessions in which girls were putting on their, their clothes and were photo photographing themselves, snapping themselves in their homes, uh, sometimes on rooftops, sometimes in their private gardens, sometimes on balconies, because, you know, the light was much, were much better light conditions, and so on, so these practices were uh, actually extremely widespread. 
and now there is a kind of a, a sensitive issue to this because it has been uh, sometimes sort of suggested that they hide sort of queerness and they may very well hide queerness. However, as much as I would personally like them to sort of prove sort of histories of queerness, uh, then to be historically correct um, uh, is not actually, it's not accurate to look at them as kind of some uh, insinuation or not necessarily as insinuation of queerness because where these uh, practices rather lay is a much broader context in which young uh, women basically just spend their free time putting on all kinds of costumes, okay? This is the kind of broader context in which this needs to be understood. And so if some of these young women were putting on male costumes and what I showed you on, on the screen was actually an instance of playing a wedding, okay? So there was this sort of dream kind of, I think it's probably kind of a dream moment in um, in sort of the cultural imagination and of many women is basically to be the bride, la Arusa, okay? So there would be always one woman who would enact the Arusa and there would be another woman who would enact the groom and who would put on, you know, male costumes. But I have also seen photographs, I have seen albums of young women in which there are pages and pages in which these photographs, uh, sorry, which these ladies photograph themselves in all kinds of male costumes, okay? So that she's clearly stealing the wardrobe of her brother, putting on costumes. She's also posing as, a, posing as a sheikh. She's also putting on a male sort of traditional costume. But these same photographic albums also show uh, uh, these women going in exactly the opposite direction and very much feminizing themselves and even kind of objectifying themselves. So I showed you actually just before that screen, I showed you a young lady putting on sort of that uh, two betali, which is the kind of uh, oriental uh, sort of peasant. It's actually highly um, sort of highly fictionalized sort of peasant dress. And so she's posing as the oriental sort of odalisk. Okay. And there were uh, these same women and these same photographic collections also show you women posing as a falaha, okay? So that's why I'm sort of talking much more about sort of performances of selfhood in which of course there may have been queerness, absolutely, but the point and sort of how incredibly widespread these practices were, it was really about experimenting with the sort of parameters, about, it was about the desire to become someone else, which is what popular culture was about, all the films was about transforming, okay? And it was about experimenting with sort of new social roles because, just last sentence, as we probably, as many of us know, women in this period were, were literally bombarded with sort of the, the imperative to become a modern lady. And so what am I supposed to become? I mean, can I actually be this? Should I be that? Okay, maybe I'm going to play with this a little bit in the privacy of my home. And so uh, just, just to add, these photographs were strictly kept in strictly private settings. I actually wrote an article about this many years ago where I explain all this and it's called peer albums. I call them peer albums because it's a specific genre to Egypt or to Middle East uh, because uh, historians of photography in the West are obsessed uh, uh, about talking of family albums, everything in sort of Western history photographs, family albums, family albums. And actually in Egypt, we have much more instances of this other type of album, which really captures young peer lives. Okay, it's young women and young men sort of having fun with themselves and snapping each other and then circulating and hiding these albums and sort of circulating them, you know, closely uh, within these sort of closed social circles that were, you know, strictly peer circles. So that no was problem. a long answer, sorry. No, no, thank you. That's really great. Uh, I have an Al uh, sorry, a question here from Alex uh, Segerman, I think. I'm sorry, I've lost his name in the thread here. Um, and he has two questions. One is, can you talk about the tinting of some of the photos you showed? Who was doing that and with what tools and why? And the second question is, you mentioned that you are doing a social history through photography. How does your book relate to social art history of photography? How my book relates to what? To social art history of photography. I don't know what social art history of photography. Okay, okay, Alex, maybe you can uh, <laughs> clarify what you mean by that and we'll, we'll thread yeah. it in again. The first question was about the tinting of the photos, you know, who was doing it, why, and uh, stuff like that. Yes, so, um, so the tinting, yes. Uh, well, it was fashionable at certain periods and uh, more so, so, so basically the very, the, the simple answer is that, um, 
at a certain period, certain studios offered this as an additional sort of luxury service, especially, you know, if it's a, if it's a studio photograph that is, uh, you know, polychromed, uh, then some studios did it professionally. It was often women's labor, as I, as I have read in uh, some smart books, because I haven't personally encountered, you know, uh, archives that would speak about this, but it's known that it was often female labor and it was sort of an additional service that the photographer, that the studio would do for you. But then at some point, I have also seen very amateur examples of this. Um, so obviously some people, amateur photographers were just doing it um, at home with sort of a little addition of aquarelle. Um, it's very cute, it looks lovely. And it was basically, it probably only shows uh, just, you know, it's an additional instance of how much people love to engage with their photographs and how much time they actually spend, you know, not only, you know, putting on their clothes and, and snapping themselves, but also subsequently, you know, engaged with these photographs by not only polychroming them or, or, or sort of tinting them, what is the word you used, but also sort of a, a, a composing elaborate albums and, and sort of this. So. Uh, but the, the question I, I didn't quite get, I'm sorry, the question about social history of photography. Well, they, they've come back to us, actually. Thanks, Alex. Uh, they said a social art history is a method of art historical study. Basically, how does this relate to the field of art history? Thank you. Well, um, I do cultural history. I do cultural history, and while I have a lot of respect for art history, my dad, Alair Hamo, was an art historian. My path is, I think, uh, very different. I insist on being a cultural historian. And uh, what I'm trying to do here, as I was saying in the, in the introduction, is sort of valorizing um, sort of visual sources, bringing them slightly more towards, you know, uh, mainstream history by actually using photographs and interfering to some big debates, you know, time, space, personhood are some very big questions that mainstream history is, is, is kind of preoccupied with. So that's, that's kind of my, if you want, agenda. But the thing that I would say, and I, as I said, I have a lot of respect for art history and especially the social of it. That's the one that I would read, but I think there probably may be one fundamental difference between the way I work and the way art historians may work, uh, which is that art historians, I think, still remain extremely attentive, not to say preoccupied, but extremely attentive to the image, to what's in the image, okay? And that is actually often for me not the most interesting thing at all. Mm, yeah, I, I actually found one of the images really, well, I found lots of them, but one in particular is really intriguing uh, from the wedding series, which was a guy in a Galabea and then this woman in a very, looked like a very, very fashionable kind of wedding dress. But anyway, I, I move on. Uh, we have a question from Justin Carville, and he says, my question is about the tension between vernacular and the universal. The vernacular in photography can be conceived of as the culturally differentiated practices of photography, as in John Kuhnhoven conceived it, rather than the common stroke ordinary characteristics of the medium of photography, such as studio portraits. I am curious to know to what extent the vernacular forms and performances of Egyptian modernity through photographic images may or may not be shaped by the global circulation and return of the photo image objects amongst Egyptian diaspora and or migrant professional classes. Yes, so it's a, it's an excellent question. Thank you very much for this. And of course, it's something that, you know, I'm also very interested in and very preoccupied with. Uh, I think large part of my introduction is kind of addressing this. Um, in a nutshell, um, there has been for about the past 20 years an absolutely wonderful sort of uh, emergence of interest in vernacular photographies around the world, right? This is actually something that I may have also added to your question, um, Ronnie, okay, about sort of uh, the sort of the historiography. So, so there has been now, of course, ever since uh, Chris Pinney's sort of path breaking work that started, I guess, 20, 25 years ago, there is now a, a sort of vast library of, you know, mostly anthropologists focusing on photographic practices, local photographic practices around the world. Um, now, I absolutely think this literature is absolutely brilliant and wonderful, but 
uh, and actually I'm not the only person to, to raise this criticism, that is often a sort of um, emphasis on difference. Okay, because at the end of the day, why should we go and study photography in India or in Ghana or in Polynesia? Because we're always, you know, as, as people interested in photography, we're interested in what is different, what is different, and we want to valorize, okay, local difference. This is actually also, at, whether as historians or as anthropologists, our business is difference, right? That's what we do. We culturally analyze difference, right? But uh, so, so, and the cultural difference is, of course, always there. When you look at some of the some of the photographs, you know, um, I can unpack those photographs or unpick and unpack them both and really show that actually, you know, what looks like a little girl is actually is actually a little boy on this photograph. This is what I do in the introduction. I show a family, you know, with two little girls and actually wait, they are not little girls, they're actually two boys. Um, because it was a very common for Egyptians uh, to dress boys as girls, specifically because of you know the ontology sort of the, the ontology of the senses and the evil eye, as I was discussing. So actually, wait, what we think that looks you know so globally uniform, there are actually local differences. So I do a little bit of this, all right? Sort of unpack certain uh, photographs that again look like perfectly sort of westernized married people, then actually say, well, actually they are cousins, and these are actually child marriages, and these are all actually you know arranged marriages. So I sort of have a sort of a reflection, if you want, on this. But ultimately, the one thing that I would like to stress, and it's actually something that I may have actually said earlier, is that despite the fact that every um, uh, photographic tradition is different, there is always local authenticity. And you know, the vernacular is always different. That's what makes it a vernacular. What ultimately I find most interesting is actually what people want to do through these photographs. And then when you look at these genres, when you look at the sort of multiplicity of these uh, photographic practices, at all these sort of visits to studio, at all these sort of posing in front of the camera, what you really see is a desire for sameness, okay? And that's what uh, I think the question was also about. So of course, these people are flocking into the studio because they want to look you know modern and now we would say western but the important point is to say that okay west you know western europe was the location of modernity but they don't want to look british they don't want to look french they don't want to look german even though these models may have come from there they want to look modern and photographic practices are the spaces of the modern and this is one of the key arguments of the book you know and sort of, and then sort of dealing with the vernacular versus universal. Yes, this is actually something that I'm trying to address through my introduction. And I think the the way to go, I don't have a sort of perfect answer to it, but the way to go, I think, is an attention is, is exactly the attention to this play of difference. You know. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question here uh, from Hamdi Reda, and um, he says through the sample images, it seems. You are you depend on a lot on one Pacific photo album uh, in the second and third section of the book, the hand colored album with small comments, as well as it seems it's an album of fine arts uh, studio prints. Uh, may you share more details about this album, the photographer, the name, the year, the prints, etc. Oh, now I see what you're talking about, guys. Yes, mm. of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, now you see the chat. <laughs> Not the chat. I actually looked back at what the slides are because, you know, I have ah, so many okay. slides. Yeah. So okay. many slides, and I've given so many talks, you know, about, you know, various aspects of photography over the past, you know, decade and more. Then when I come to doing a presentation, I sort of I, I don't necessarily always create new slides. I pull things together from previous PowerPoints. And so I was like thinking, oh my God, which one are you talking about? So yes, Hamdi, thank you for this question. Um, yes, and so it, it is indeed, uh, I didn't actually too much rely on him, really. I only showed like two or three um, slides from him, but I think uh, you mean a person uh so it's 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 basically it's two albums uh, by a young man called hosni he was born in 1926 in fayum and he uh in the late sort of mid 1940s mid to late 1940s when he was around sort of 20 he was a student at the uh, yes, for Cairo, Applied Arts College in Cairo. And he was writing long narrative diaries um, and journals of love. 
and uh, he was snapping himself and photographing himself and he was sort of composing in his album this sort of you know very filmic um and very sort of uh yeah lyrical if you want sort of stories and and so and, and so so basically the story is that this was one of the things that kind of led me to the to my kind of career path because i found a plastic shanta with his personal papers in Sural Esbekeya uh probably more than 15 years ago and i have literally literally built my career on him because you know my big two uh, research projects were largely inspired by his work uh by sort of what i found in that shanta and so even though it's sort of eventually two different projects i'm presenting today about this project on photography um i also have another big sort of project that i'm hoping to work on later is on basically love and forms of writing you know it's about sort of young men in interwar Egypt or early 20th century um egypt and sort of their sort of um sort of writing self-writing so back to this um so this young man actually gave me lots of these ideas uh, specifically because you know i was reading his diaries and you know his sort of musing on love and on women and sort of his states of love and his sort of dissecting his soul and i was looking at the albums and i noticed he's doing exactly the same thing you know he's he's doing exactly the same thing by basically using two different technologies two different media to really kind of look into his own exterior his own interior and to exteriorize it through narrative practices would they be visual or would they be um would they be uh textual and uh, yes and then i noticed this and then i started noticing this across many other sources i have never ever actually found sort of anonymous such a treasure trove of anonymous materials in which you know the same person would be creating you know albums and diaries but i just started paying attention to what are these young people doing with the camera and what are they doing with their pen in their diaries and you know both of these were very common practices so so i hope i have answered this question Yes, you did. Thank you, really. That's great, Lucy. Um, and actually, for everyone out there, Lucy has written a number of great articles. That's how I came across her. And one is on archives and actually researching images in Egypt, which is a really fascinating uh, paper, I think, in the Arab Studies Quarterly. Is that right? Yeah. So if you want to really find out about uh, researching visual image content and how it's changed over time, over the 20 years or so you've been uh, doing it. Um, it's a really great paper. I read it a few months ago. Uh, sadly, everyone, this is actually all the time we have allotted for the webinar. And I just want to thank you all for attending and for your participation and questions. Um, please send us emails if you have anything. Dina, can you put our emails into the chat so people have them? Um, and just to let you know that we will be continuing with the photographic journey and moving into the 20th, 21st century with the presentation next week, the 26th of May, same time, five o'clock Cairo time with Heba Farid, um, who where she'd be looking at contemporary photographic practices in Egypt. And I hope you can all uh, come again and uh, participate and thank you for your time. And there are lots of great suggestions going through. Okay, uh, the chat box, I can see it's flying around. Okay, but anyway, I just wanted to thank Lucy and for all of you for coming, to Mark and Dina, for Amor for organizing all the technical stuff in the background that helps us all do these wonderful events, uh, and to the AUC for hosting us, and to all of you for attending, and I hope you'll join in next Wednesday for uh, Heba Fareed uh, on 26th of May. Thank you very much for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.